Um, it's time now to introduce the Industry Leaders Debate, which is entitled Chain The Changing Dynamic of the Customer and the Service Provider Relationship. To moderate that debate, I'd like to invite upon the stage Julian Birkinshaw, who is the London Business School Term Chair, Professor for Strategy and Entrepreneurship and Chair of Strategy and Entrepreneurship Faculty of the London Business School. If you could uh, join your guests on stage. Great. Thanks. So, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to first of all introduce my panelists, the three panelists. Uh, to my right, Simon Hay, who's the chief executive of Dunhumby. This is um, a very well-known company to people in the know. For those of you who are not, think of the Tesco club card, think of the enormous body of data that Tesco has put together over the years about all of us in terms of our buying habits. Dunhumby is the company that essentially helped to create that and does all the analysis, if you like, as to what all that means. So very much a leader in, in the world of big data, arguably in the UK, probably the first big data company. To my left, I have Kelly Leach, who's MD of the Dow Jones Company in Europe. Uh, for most of us, that means the Wall Street Journal. Uh, many of you are subscribers to the Wall Street Journal. Many of you use their services on a daily basis. And clearly, they have, like many of the companies in this room, the challenge of how best to figure out how users use their services online through the various different devices and platforms and how best to, to turn that to commercial gain. And then to my far left, we have Royston Seawood, who is a partner at Deloitte, uh, and more specifically in, in charge of their digital practice, Deloitte Digital. And many of you, of course, think of Deloitte as a, as a big traditional company. Uh, Royston is very much at the kind of the, the sharp end of things. Uh, because he runs the, the digital practice, which has got a, a, an office, offices around Silicon, Silicon Roundabout here in London, and they develop apps, they develop services, they develop software for clients, as well as providing advice and so forth to, to those clients. So uh, the three panelists, obviously, enormous experience in all these issues around how digitization is changing the way the world works. I want to, to start with a fairly obvious question, which really does linked very nicely back to what Sarah just talked about. What we've seen in her video, of course, is the, uh, the immediate viral impact of a good video. And those of us who have teenage kids will know that our kids love these things. They're incredibly impatient. They're very flighty in terms of the way that they, they consume this sort of digital quality, co content. So the, the question I guess all three of us have to ask, and I'll, I'll start with Kelly, is how do we capitalize on this? How do we make sure that as businesses we get inside the minds of our consumers in terms of the way that they use this content and ensure that we create products and services that match that. Kelly, I'll ask you, sure. to, and then I'll move to Royce. Sure. Well, I think for us, it's been really trying to keep our finger on the pulse of how our customers are using the data. And one of the things that I think has been fortunate for us is Dow Jones has not only the Wall Street Journal, but the Newswire's business, yeah. which traditionally has been about speed and pushing out small bits of very valuable content quickly. So with things like our website and our apps, we've been able to really marry those to the kind of the depth and quality of the, the journal content and the, the in-depth analysis, but also the, the speed of the Newswire, which is part of our heritage. And I think kind of thinking about that sort of the curve and you know, owning the story when it first comes out, but then as it unfolds, making sure that we continue to own it and breaking new pieces of information about the story. And then the next day in the paper, being able to provide more context than you get as, you know, over the course of the day that the story happens. So for us, it's something about, it's really about taking the various bits of content and capabilities that we've had in, as an organization and marrying them up in a, in a different way. And has that been a difficult transition? In other words, obviously, you know, 20 years ago, you were a traditional, very traditional journalistic outfit. Uh, and clearly, the skills that you've had to develop to, to become a digital player are significant. Has that been a painful transition? I don't, think, I don't think it has been for us. I mean, I think that there certainly is some amount of experimentation that doesn't always play out as you hope it, it would. But I do think that we, in many ways, had an advantage over our competitors because we had that newswires business and because there was this 
this focus on short form, fast content within our business, and now being able to push that out in other ways other than just the wire over smartphones and apps, I think is something that we you know, continue to focus on evolving the products and making sure that we're not just delivering the products that we had been delivering over a new channel, but really thinking fresh about what the content is uh, for those, those new channels. Right. Royston, let me get you involved. Uh, what's your experiences of um, companies you know, across industries, not, not just, not just um, you know, um, journalism, if you like, but across industries, figuring out how to get the right content to their users through the right sort of channels? So I think one of the big challenges that um, I've seen is that organizations still think a lot about what their product is and right. don't think enough about what the end consumer of that product wants. And it's actually a bit, bit like trying to get businesses to stop looking from the inside out and start looking a bit from the outside in. So if you take content, the sort of content that you want to deliver to somebody on a mobile phone is going to have a certain type of uh, volume to it, a certain type of timeliness and context. It might be location aware, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I do think that lots of businesses still struggle with this idea of, of actually saying, hold on, we're a product-driven company. I've got a brilliant idea. I'm going to define this product to find that actually how it's used and the context in which it's used is either not given the uptake that they need or, or frankly, not, not, not what they planned. And I think the organization that can actually think outside in first and then be pretty flexible and adaptable to see what's happening through all this massive data we've got gives you the chance to adapt and actually meet that customer need better. Give us an example, a company that, that has you know, really uh, sort of revolutionized the way that they look at a particular product or service from the, from the, from the consumer back. So it, it, one really good example, there's a US bank that uh, we, we mentioned briefly earlier called GoBank that is a mobile only bank. So that, that is something that is just targeted to people who only want to interact with their bank on the mobile. They don't want to deal with a call center, et cetera, et cetera. The two things that they've done is look at what the customer wants. The first thing they want to do is find an ATM when they're on the move. And the second thing they want to do is check the balance before they go and make a purchasing decision. Those are things that you can do without being logged in, without dealing with this complex authentication experience. And the customers are saying, that's a fair value exchange, actually. I'm prepared to have that. Uh, out or beyond the login, uh, and, and, and that is something that I see the value of. And, and, and most banks would, would, would go crazy with the idea of providing information around uh, a customer's uh, balance yep. without having gone through some really complex two-factor right. authentication right. using some right. dongle you have to carry around. <laughs> Interesting. We're going to come back to kind of new business models towards the end. Simon, let, let me get um, your views on this. I mean, obviously, to a large degree in Dunhumby, you are making sense of our habits as consumers, perhaps in ways that we don't even realize ourselves. Um, speak a bit about how you, how you do that, it's because for many people in the audience, uh, you know, the, the sort of the black box of analysis that you do is, is going to be a little bit impenetrable. Can you, can you share with us a little bit how, how you know, my, you know, my, the checkout receipt from, from Tesco's gets translated into information that you, you use, that the Tesco's then uses uh, and other companies also use? Well, I think, a bit like Royston said, we actually try and think from the customer experience back. So, you know, what is the customer telling us through the data? They're telling us what they like, what they dislike. They're telling us the prices they respond to, the promotions they respond to, the stores they like. There are so many things we can use to translate. And it's amazing how organizations tend to be driven by, you know, their old practices, old processes, old way of thinking and acting. Yeah. And the, the challenge, really, of our world is that when we see something in the data, you can be challenging the way organizations are set up or structured or, or you know, the strategy they're pursuing. And the art of a, of a leader of listening to the data, really understanding it, because not all data is equal, right. despite the, you know, the ubiquitous big data term we, right. we wrap around it all. You know, what does it mean and what are we going to do about it? And how do we use that to create a better experience? So we take the tool receipt and we use that where we can deliver a personalized experience that can be online, that can be through coupons on the, on the mobile, at home. And that's really very simple, which is trying to give you offers on things you like, uh, as opposed to most advertising is to try to get, you know, sell you things that you don't buy or don't like and don't engage with. Uh, but of course, how do we pull that back into the, into the organization itself to change the way you know, buyers are thinking, buyers are measured, 
store managers view the world? You know, how do we just get the organisation to think you know, more crisply and concisely about the customer, really, to, to Royston's point? Right, right, right. So let's, let's dig a bit deeper into this, this notion of big data, because it's, it's a term that has you know, kind of taken over in, the last, in my experience in the last couple of years. Uh, and of course, as always, it means different things to different people. As I said, you're, you're a company that, that really built itself on this notion that we can, we can take enormous volumes of data about everyday user uh, experiences, everyday user purchases and behavior online, uh, and use it in insightful ways. And I just want all three of, all three of you actually to comment on this if, if you can, because, because it does seem to me that there's both an enormous opportunity here, but there's also a, a, a risk, as it were, that we allow the computers to take over. Can, can you be a bit specific for, for the sake of those perhaps who don't know how, how this works? I mean, how, how would you go about you know, scrutinizing a big body of data, um, and we're talking, we're talking exabytes of data in, in some ways, um, uh, how do we scrutinize this data to come up with insights that we can then feed back to, our, to the clients of Dunhumby? Well, I guess we start very simply with a question or a hypothesis. What are we actually trying to prove or disprove? The idea of surfing through huge volumes of data to find interesting things. You will find interesting things, whether they're useful or actionable or, or make a difference is a, is a different matter altogether. Uh, I mean, as everyone saw in the paper, that great correlation between margarine usage and divorce rates, right? It is a 99.9% .9 correlation. So therefore, if you eat less, less margarine, you get divorced, right? Now, it's obviously patently nonsense, right, but it is statistically right. proven yep. through data. Right. Um, so, you know, what is the question we're going to ask as opposed to trying to find, you know, margarine and divorce rates? Uh, and then what is the data we need, you know, that will be valuable in that process? Right. You know, what is the real data, the behavioral data? Right. What is the attitudinal data? You know, not just what customers do, what do they think? How are they, you know, addressing that in different channels? What's the difference between the online world and the store world? What's the difference between the mobile space, the tablet space? You know, all of the above. Uh, and then what are you going to do with it? As I say, how do you actually drive knowledge and decisions? Uh, and yeah. some of those can be very well made by machines, you know, machine learning and artificial yeah. intelligence, if it's the right place. But generally, we're dealing with human systems, organisation still, you know, companies of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of employees. And who are you going to equip, what are information, so they make smarter decisions in the future? Right. Right. Rosie, what's your, what's your experience of, of the show? We say they're both the promise and the pitfalls of, of big data. So I think there are three points that I think are quite important to, to, to sort of take, and it builds upon what, what Simon was saying, really. Um, you, you do need to know what question it is you're trying to answer before you sort of get into interrogating that data. And having a clear view of that and almost having a hypothesis-led approach and being able to respond quickly is definitely a, a good way to think about it. The second thing is actually you need the right sort of minds inside your organisation or with your partners in order to interpret this. And so just having the right hypothesis, now I think that the, the, the skill set and the, if you like, data scientist role that everybody is hyping up becomes quite a critical role. And then the third thing is that you need to be able to respond really, really quickly. So you've got a hypothesis, you've had the best brains thinking about how to use that, you go and deploy that in a new service, which might be around a campaign or a new product offering or price point. You need to be responding to how consumers are behaving because the customer may not um, behave in the way that you expect. And so the ability to then respond and react really, so timeliness right. is really, really important in this world. And I think that, that you, lots of organizations will kind of get one, right. some of them get two, and I think that three is still a stretch for a lot of organizations. Right. 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 Because there's a, there's a risk, isn't there, that, that, that data and information becomes this sort of this, uh, I, I don't know, it, we, we sort of, um, we try to convince ourselves that the answer lies in the data. Uh, and to some degree, it might do. But of course, we can't get that out unless we're both quite you know, thoughtful about the questions we ask, as well as very responsive. Ke Kelly, what's your experience of this? I mean, does, does Dow Jones do a lot of this gathering and, and making sense of, of, of data in real, real time? We do. But I mean, I would come back to the point that Simon made that I think part of the, the key is understanding what are the limitations to that data. I mean, we still have you know, a, a staff of nearly 1,900 journalists around the world, and part of what our brand is about and what people value is the judgment that they have. And using the data and understanding what our readers value is one piece, but then also understanding if some news breaks that is critically important, 
you can't necessarily rely on the data because it's something new that just happened. So it's to me, it's mixing sort of the intelligence and the, the experience of our editors with the data and understanding when to use which, which, uh, which source of intelligence. And if I can just follow up on that specific point, because one, one of the issues, particularly in the, in, in the world of, 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 of the newspapers, is, is the sort of the, um, the veracity of the source. In other words, you know, one of the things that, that we care about is who is telling us something and do we trust them? And, I, and I've seen various data on this that says that, in fact, increasingly, you know, a story about a company uh, that's in, uh, likely to believe the story if it comes from the chief executive of that company than if it comes from you know, a person like us. And sometimes a person like us means someone we've never met, someone we don't know anything about. I mean, how, how does that play out in the world of journalism? Because obviously you, you have journalists who are trustworthy, who you, you're trying to make a, a business case, if you like, that that is more value-added content, as yeah. it were, than the stuff that you know, the blogosphere gives. How, how, do you, how do you ensure that, that that story comes through? Well, I think that, I mean, that's a key part of, I think, our brand message is that for the, the sorts of decisions that our readers are making, they want to know that they've got the most accurate information. But we're also able to then monitor what's going on in social media and try to verify it if, if it's something that can be verified. So. So to me, it's, I mean, we sort of have to realize we don't exist in a bubble, but at the same time, part of what our brand is about is trust and the fact that we're, we are going to report things that we, that we verify. So I think it's using all the tools that are now available to us and just being, I think, smart about it, but also knowing that our readers expect us to, uh, you know, to, 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 to go that extra mile and make sure that we're reporting accurate information. Simon, I want to go back, and this is a slightly challenging question, but it's, it's, I expect it's one that you're readily able to answer, which is, you know, in a world of, of increasingly shared information, uh, I mean, obviously companies have their private information, but increasingly the stuff that's valuable, every company is doing similar sorts of things. You know, where's, where's the competitive advantage? Because Tesco clearly stole a march on their competitors because they were the first guys to come up with a club card which gave them this information. But now, this is kind of table stakes. I mean, every, every supermarket worth its salt has the same data. So where is the competitive advantage in, in big data? I, I've got a you know, slightly sort of you know, skeptical view that actually we can get something proprietary out of this that our competitors can't match. What's, what's the answer to that when you talk to your clients about, yeah. about this? Well, I think it's, you know, Royston touched on some of the points. It's not just about the data. There's a piece around culture. I mean, it's in simple terms, you know, it is a hygiene factor of doing business, but look at the world of retail for the past, you know, 200 years. It's a replicable, copyable business. There's no secret about how you run a store, what you put in it. Some people do it better than others. Right. So, you know, analytics absolutely is a source of competitive advantage, the speed at which you analyse it, the sense you make of it. And there's a huge piece around metrics and measures, you know, the human part of an organisation. Yeah. Yeah. How do you reward an organisation? How do you measure an organisation? And how do you get the outcomes you're looking for? I was, I was talking to someone in the, uh, actually in the police recently who was saying that it's difficult because of the way crime statistics are measured. If you believe crime is taking place in a part of town, you go after it, you create arrests, therefore you get crime statistics that show you've got a problem. So actually, <laughs> it's better, better not to go after the crime in the first place if that's the measure that you truly, truly care about. So you see that many times in commercial business yeah. where the measure can get out of alignment with the outcome you're trying to create. So it's the linking of the, and I guess this is perhaps obvious, but the linking of the insights about what the data tells us back into the behaviours and measures inside our organisations, and some presumably are much better at that than others. Yeah, and it is, I mean, funnily enough, as the science has got more complex and the algorithms smarter and the machines faster, yeah. the art of business, you know, the, the soft skills, the cultural piece, yeah. you know, the flexibility to the editors to make their own decisions, the, you know, the environment in which they thrive yeah. is as important or perhaps even more important than right. just the science. So right. we almost swing to this, you know, left brain world of big data, but forget the right brain world. And right. the paradox is it's right and left brain. Yeah. Exactly. No, indeed. And, and, and as you say, the, 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 the smarter the, the computers become, as it were, the more premium we're putting on the companies who are actually able to harness creativity and emotion and some of the, the, the softer parts of, 
of business. Any, any observations on that one? I, I, so, I mean, the, the one thing I would say, and I completely agree that the, the art and that creativity with, with, if you like, the science of data together is where the differentiation happens. And if you look at that, I think that's quite a big implication for organisations and the sort of talent that you bring into it. And you need more creativity and, frankly, more diversity in that creativity in a way that maybe... 20, 30 years ago, you didn't need. You could have everybody who was a similar sort of model and a similar sort of mindset. And now having people who challenge yeah. is definitely going to be more and more important. How do you do that at, uh, at Dad Jones? I mean, you, you, you need to have, you know, snappy videos, perhaps not, you know, not, not, not the chickens, but some sort of snappy videos which the, you know, today's readers and tomorrow's readers sure. are going to be watching. That's a very different form of development of content. Uh, and what little I know of the newspaper world tells me that, you know, traditionally the journalists were at the top of the tree, the commercial people were second, and the, and the kind of the techie people were somewhere down at the bottom. You know, the techie people are now elevated to a level where they have to work in a seamless way with the journalists. Yeah. Uh, that must create some enormous management challenges. It's, it's, uh, there are certainly challenges, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. You know, before uh, our session, I was mentioning a uh, training that we do, uh, DJ at DJ, Digital Journalism at Dow Jones, which is really intended to give the journalist, regardless of how long they've been with the company or kind of what their experience is, exposure to things like social media and how can they leverage that for their reporting, things like video and how do we use that as a tool for storytelling, things like interactive graphics and, and having people our readers really engage with the content in a different way. So part of culturally how we've dealt with it is building, making it something that's not, it shouldn't be something that's scary to the journalist. We want to empower them and arm them with the tools that they need to basically do the job that we need them to do now. So I think that's a key part of, of what we've done to, to, to transform our news organization. I'm going to open it up to questions in, in a couple of minutes, but um, before I do, the la last question I wanted to ask all three of you is, is about business models. In other words, how do we, how do we make money? Because uh, it's quite easy to get people to, you know, to read content online. It's quite easy to get, to get us to some degree you know, open to, to, to making use of the services that we offer through these different channels. But to turn that, of course, into something uh, commercially viable is, is different. Now, um, I'll go to Royston first, if I may, because um, you, know, you, you span a lot of different industries. What's the most successful, progressive way of, shall we say, making a commercial business model out of some of these more progressive online um, uh, offerings that you've seen? Or so that's a, that's a great question. I yeah. think lots of businesses are still tr experimenting with right. the answer to that question. Right. But I think there are a, a couple of observations that for some businesses, they need to think that the margins that they've been used to in traditional businesses are different. In that digital world, the expectation and how you monetize, whether that be through subscription, like Wall Street Journal is able to do because its content is so premium, yeah. versus the Daily Mail, where that's an advertising model because uh, you know, the, the people aren't going to pay huge amounts for that. And, and I think that experimenting with those models is what we've seen quite a lot of. And being able to pretty quickly understand what's working and what's not. And, and it's a series of small nudges. I think the days of writing five-year strategic business models where you know the answer yeah. for 2020 are, are gone. Right. Indeed. And, and presumably, I mean, we, we all know that the Wall Street Journal, is, of course, is, uh, is charging for, for online content, as, uh, and not, not exclusively so, but um, tell us about how you've got, how you got to the model that you've, you, you've reached there, and are you comfortable that that is, that is a working model? Well, I mean, I, it, it's been something that has been very successful for us, but I also think it's incredibly early days in terms of what readers expect and are willing to pay for online. I mean, we've been doing it now for, for quite a while. The site effectively was, was paid soon after it was launched. But I think the, the, the potential that mobile and other things have, and also not, not forgetting that even in a digital world, people also, I think, come to value in-person experiences. I mean, things like this, this conference. And I think that's opened up, thinking about our brand in different ways have, has opened up other possibilities of how we can monetize right. content basically in a live format. 
not, not unlike the education industry, which I'm part of, right? We, these massive online courses exist, yeah. but they're never going to completely take yeah. away from a more traditional so, sort of Socratic method of sure. learning. Simon, so, mean, any thoughts on business models here? I mean, obviously, you're selling a service, which you know, your clients are paying for. But at some level, they're trying to, if you like, monetize the insights that, that you give them. How, how does that play out in terms of changing business models? I think our challenge is no different from anyone else's, which you have to continually reinvent the business model, look at what it is, what it can be, look at the opportunities, look at the challenges. You know, as you said, Royston, the five-year plan, it's, you know, actually it changes month by month. You know, there's some constancies, but things that you can change. And the reality of new technology is it requires new thinking and new ways of working, and we all have to adapt and move with that speed. Right. OK, thanks. So, look, I'm going to open it up to, to questions. Um, I'm not quite sure how should we, are the light's going to go up so that we can see who's asking the questions. Thank you. Um, and I guess we've got some roving mics as, as, as always. Um, so I'm happy to take, we're happy to take questions on pretty much anything. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you've heard three very interesting stories about our, our panel's experiences. Uh, we can move into more depth and some of those things we can move into to broader issues. Can I, can I get a there's, a, there's a chap over there who's beckoning for a microphone. Um, you can see us better than we can see you, so uh, please. Uh, so, and do state your name and your affiliation before you get started, if you would. My, my name is uh, Neil McFater, and uh, I'm a retired uh, technologist. Um, I'm interested, there's, there's, there's been mention of uh, some of the analytics coming up with um, significant implications uh, going up the org escalating up the organization I'd, I'd be interested to hear some examples if it's possible to mention any about uh, uh, changes that were instigated in uh, strategy uh, or in structure uh, or in culture of an organization that came out from the big data that is you know very very much the top of the pyramid yeah. Yeah, so as a result of this correct analysis um, have, have we seen then companies actually make significant changes in how they're organised, how they're, they're different channels to market or, or whatever? Who wants to have a go at that? So I can give you an example of, uh, of uh, a, a, a business that uh, started thinking about as a bit of an experiment using a social platform to provide customer service. And so in that scenario, what was happening was uh, for a telco. So telco subscribers were providing answers and responses to other customers about problems. Um, and they started to sort of see this trend and going, well, hold on a minute, customer satisfaction was starting to go up because the people who wanted answers to questions were seeing uh, more, more relevant and more pointed answers from people with real world experience, not just following the script, mm. which led them to think, hold on a minute, how do I now structure my customer service experience? Suddenly the weight of, uh, of, of that social channel and the data that they could gather based on who was asking questions and who was responding threw up two really interesting things. So one was they could work out who their thousand most influential subscribers were and amplify their voice because they kept on responding mm. to questions. And it became a really fabulous way then of targeting them with upgrades to products and services. Really cheap trade promotions. They then amplify that within their customer base. They've got a fabulous viral marketing uh, or, or social marketing campaign mm. that hasn't come from the brand itself, so therefore is inherently more trusted. Right. It's just a really, and that isn't necessarily about a big data problem per se, but that is about using data that they wouldn't have necessarily previously thought about using and nudging what they did in order to respond, which has suddenly taken some cost out, improved customer satisfaction, helped them sell more. Do you want to respond on this one, Kelly? Or? No? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, I guess the only thing, I, I guess the example I would give is uh, our development of mobile and that pretty early on we saw the growth rate and, and realized that it, there was going to be a point relatively soon where mobile usage of our content would eclipse desktop usage. And so I think allowing us to see that uh, in advance let us plan some things organizationally, uh, shifting develop, more development resources to focus on that really orienting our product development much more to an experience on a tablet or a smartphone as opposed to a desktop. So, I mean, that's, I think, one example of seeing something 
early on, realizing the trajectory and the implications. Do you want to go on this one, or shall I move to the next question? A, a, a very quick one. Um, I work in about 60 countries with Dunhumby. And, uh, but my boss is Philip Clark, CEO of Tesco. So if you want to see someone uh, dealing with the street, strategic, structural and cultural implications of the new wave of retailing in the store world, you can see it playing out uh, in front of you. Uh, you know, how do you invest in that new world where you've got to compete in a very different way with very different cost structures and you know, really complete with the tech giants in what they're spending on technology and also how do you still you know, make money from the old world? And uh, that's a fairly public example. Yes, of exactly. And, the, and the, 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 yes, the, the painful trans transition that is, is underway there. Come, another question. Um, okay. Does someone have a microphone in their hand? It's, I think it's working its way across to the chap with the white shirt. Please. Uh, Alex Gayer, Jimba, 2005. Um, I guess this is a question for the whole panel, but there seems to be an increasing backlash against companies monetizing data. Yeah. How do you see those trends panning out and what are the implications for businesses going forward? Yeah, good. So I, I thought this might crop up at some point, but this issue of you know, data that to some degree we as individuals feel is ours and, and is somehow being used by others. And perhaps do you want to have a go at this one first? Simon? Sure. I, I think it's entirely right. I think there are too many things that happen with data that customers don't know about or don't understand. You know, we try to write with our clients around the world, you know, a 10 sentence, you know, sort of 140 character sort of Twitter type explanation of the data policy that contrasts with 189 pages, which is written by most of the, you know, the big sort of tech organizations. I don't think people realize that, you know, Google reads the contents of their email. You know, people don't know that when you use the Facebook app, they have the right to read your text messages, what you send to who and the other. Uh, and there's a whole great data market. So if you downloaded in the past the iPhone Torch, what you probably didn't realise in exchange for your ability to see your way home from the pub, you'd actually given the right to everything on your phone forevermore that's pulling back in that direction that they, use, they monetize in the advertising market. So we have to give much more transparency to customers, be very clear what we're doing with the data. We have to give them control, the choice to say, I, I, I'm happy for you to do this, but I don't want you to do that. You know, my social media is private, whatever else it might be. You know, and we have to deliver value. So we have to use the data respectfully uh, in a way that, um, that they enjoy and want. Uh, and we've always tried to do that, and we'll always try to do that, because I think it's the right thing to do. So how do we get the balance right on that? Because I, mean, I think everyone can see that there's a tension between you know, allowing our data to be used versus keeping it secret. Yeah, so I, I think it's the real challenge is getting the value exchange balance right. right. And I think that for organisations that can work out how to get that value exchange, I'm prepared to give up quite a lot of my personal information if you provide value back to me and in the way I want it. And it's back to the control point, Simon, that you made. I might not want you to be spamming me with text messages three times a day, but you know, if you can offer me relevant services and products based on the value exchange that we've agreed, then I'm happy as a consumer. And I think the problem with that is different uh, sectors and segments will have a different value exchange. And so the flexibility point and control is really, really important. Yeah, good. Anything else on there? Good. So maybe one, one more question, uh, and then we're going to have to close this session. Do I see another question? OK, there's, a, there's one in the middle there, if you can get a microphone to him. Uh, Ember, Tom Gadsden, Ember Globals. Um, what we've heard here, I think, takes nothing, well, really exaggerates the importance of asking good questions. Right. Are there particular individuals or companies or simply guidelines you've seen that have uh, created great questions? Please. Yeah, interesting. So, how, in a world of big data, the quality of the question matters more than ever. And your question is, do we have any examples or guidelines on, on shall we say, asking the smart, smart questions? It's a hell of a question. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps you win the award. But, um, <laughs> um, but any, any thoughts on that? I, I well, think it's a great question to kind of wrap up on. We, we uh, it, it really um, extol the virtues of curiosity in our business. So it's a cultural answer which is really to ask the questions that haven't been asked before. We also use the phrase, I use the phrase, if it ain't broke, break it. Uh, because so many things in business is determined and shaped by history. 
you know, you ask, why is it done this way? Well, it's always been done this way. So I think, you know, actually having the ability to ask, frankly, what can sometimes be like stupid questions uh, is really the best. So I don't think there's the book of great questions, but it's the cultural environment, which is probably any question is a good one, and particularly the one that challenges those accepted norms. Because a lot of the time they're based on false data, history, false assumptions, and those are the things that really hurt you. You've got to, you know, get to the bottom of those. Any examples of you know, either great questions or right way of coming up with the right, the right way of doing this? So I, I don't have a great example, but I do think that the point I made earlier about having a bit of diversity and creativity mm -hmm. in your management team and your leadership yeah. team is one of the ways that I think you could use to get questions asked from a different perspective. And I think that uh, you see a lot now organizations thinking about what do they do with digital? Do I need a chief digital officer? What are they there to come and do at the board? Disrupt, ask different questions. And so that, to me, is the, 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 the critical thing. How does this work at Dow Jones? I, I would just say that, to me, a big part of it is the scrutiny that you, that you put the data through. And if somebody's coming and giving you answers or suggesting that there are correlations, I think having as a cultural standard that it's okay to challenge the data. The, the data isn't necessarily always right, and it can be sort of manipulated or used to tell different stories. So I think developing a culture of criticalness when it comes to data, I think to me is is an important an important aspect. You no, know, as a social scientist, um, I know that. Uh, you know, if you talk to the data long enough, you can pretty much tell any story that you so, cho so choose. So it really does put a premium back on, on, on thought and judgment. And, and for me, I think you know, most of our big organizations uh, typically end up getting run by people with, with a background in you know, accounting or engineering or something like that. And of course, you know, accountants and engineers are all tra taught to look for sort of the, the logical scientific proof uh, about something and uh, and of course there's value in that but but I do worry in businesses you know across the board some in sectors worse than others that we put too much faith in that sort of um, I guess it's uh, I guess it's left brain thinking uh, and we need a bit more of the well the whole brain but but certainly more of the, more of the right brain which is to say that we need more creativity we need more more emotion we need more more ac acceptance of intuition and judgment in the workplace. And that's a very, very difficult thing. I mean, as Royston says, you know, getting diversity in, into, into a, into a decision-making group is important, but also to have the guts, if you like, to be able to say, you know, this is, this is the right call. I, I like the example from Jeff Bezos of Amazon. I think many of you will have heard this quote. You know, Bezos says, look, there's, there's two types of decisions we make at Amazon. There's the, you know, there's the ones based on, if you like, A-B testing. There's the fact-based decisions. Do we change this website? You can get hard data to kind of prove that point. Uh, at some point, Amazon is quite famous, I think, for saying, look, we can't actually market test whether the Kindle or the smartphone will fly. At that point, we have to then go back to a different mode of operating, which is what does my judgment, what does my experience, what does my gut tell me is the right way? And they're not afraid, as we know, to make these big leaps of faith so it's a curious mix at Amazon between very, very scientific evaluation as well as much more judgment-based. And for me, that's an interesting model. I'm not trying to say they've got it right every time, but it's quite clear that they've understood that those two different models have to be complements to one another. So I'm going to close this session. Thank you very much, Kelly, Royston, and Simon, for all your thoughts. Uh, please join me in giving them a round of applause. Julian Birkinshaw, thank you so much for that fascinating debate there. Personalizing big data is a fiendishly complicated subject, and I'm sure that many of you will uh, get the chance to carry on that conversation online and also throughout the networking sessions that are taking place to, during the lunch break. Um, let me just remind you of those. You'll have the chance to... Uh, to, to interact with some of, uh, some of your colleagues in this field uh, after that. But before that, uh, we will also be heading into the big ideas session. Now, before this, I just want to ask polling question number five. So if you have your little gadgets and gizmos, please choose one of these four options. As you can see, what percentage of company profits do you think should be spent on analyzing big data? One, 10%, 20%, 30%, 
more than 5%, 5% or less, or 1%. And I'm sure that a lot of this depends on which sector you're actually in as well. So 5% or less seems to be the winner here. Um, so big data is still increasingly important, as you can see, but 5% uh, or less, no more than 10%, according to 48% uh, percent of people there. Now, we are going to be heading into the big ideas sessions, and let me just to introduce you to those. So you have three eminent London Business School academics who are going to be sharing their ideas. Um, let's start out with just introducing the fact that we have Andrew Scott, Professor of Economics and the Deputy Dean of Programmes at the London Business School, who's going to be chairing a session um, which is entitled New Ages and New Stages, the Interaction of uh, Technology and Demography and the Changing Social Media World. We also have Rajesh Chandri, who is also from the London Business School. He's going to be chairing another session there called Trade Technology and Management, the Emerging Markets Perspective. And last but not least, Dr. Michael G. Jacobides, who will be chairing a session on making value migrate your way. So I encourage you to head down into those sessions, the big idea sessions afterwards. You can head into lunch, and there are three networking areas that you can engage in there. Thanks so much.